Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we are talking about wood movement, the expansion and contraction, warping and twisting of boards that really confuses people. What actually is wood movement? What causes it and how can we prevent it? Let's take a look at this. Now before we get to talking too much about the actual expansion and contraction of wood, I want to separate two different thoughts. Wood expands and contracts from temperature. So the hotter it is, the bigger the piece of wood is. The colder it is, the smaller the piece of the wood is. Now most everything on Earth does that as well. Glass expands and contracts. Concrete expands and contracts. The Earth itself expands and contracts. A couple days ago we had thunder where the ground shrunk so much due to the cold that it was actually a loud bang. It happens to everything. And that's one of the reasons why putting epoxy in a table really isn't that much of a problem because the epoxy has a very similar expansion and contraction rate to the wood when it comes to temperature. But there's a big difference between temperature expansion and contraction and moisture expansion and contraction. See, wood is very porous and it can absorb a lot of water. And as it absorbs water, it will expand. And as it gets rid of water, it will decrease. Whereas with something like epoxy, which isn't porous and doesn't absorb water, the epoxy will not expand and contract due to moisture, whereas the wood will. And so if you have something outside with epoxy in it, it might run into issue with the wood expanding and contracting and the epoxy not. So because of that, a piece of furniture that's designed to be outside needs to be designed with expansion and contraction in mind because it will absorb a lot of water in the wet season and it will get rid of that in the dry season. And something that was designed for inside may not have to worry about it so much, especially if it's air conditioned and you have a similar temperature and a similar moisture content throughout the year. The wood isn't going to move as much in a air conditioned environment. Now, if you're in a house without air conditioning, your wood will move and expand and contract a little bit more. Not quite as much as if it were outside, but it will have more expansion and contraction as there's more moisture change throughout the year. So the first thing we need to understand is how exactly does the tree grow? And the tree grows by putting on a layer on the outside each time. And if the tree is moist and wet and live, it doesn't have any problem because there's an even moisture going all the way throughout the tree. But when you start drying the tree, you start seeing these cracks form. And the cracks always come from the center out. And you'll see smaller cracks out here. And the reason for that being is that there is less of a radial pattern here. So when this actually shrinks because water disappears from it, this pattern moves a very little bit. And then you come out a little bit more, and it moves a little bit more. And you come out a little bit more, and it moves a little bit more. And you come out a little bit more, and it moves even more. And that's how the crack grows wider and wider. So the amount of expansion and contraction right here is the amount of movement that will happen over this circumference when this goes from completely wet to completely dry. So if you think about wood in three dimensions, number one, you have the length of the board. Number two, you have the distance from the pith to the outside. And then number three, you have the circumference of the board, so going around in a circle. So now with the length of the board, there really isn't much of any expansion contraction end to end. The wood does not expand up and down the length of its cord. It will do a little bit due to heat shrinking and contracting, but not much at all in comparison to what moisture will cause. So then from the core to the outside, there is a tiny bit of expansion and contraction this way, but there isn't that much. It's most of the time something you don't measure because there isn't a whole lot of distance from here to here. However, if you go in the circumference, there is a lot of expansion and contraction. And this, being about three feet around in circumference, you have probably about a half inch of expansion and contraction here where the wood has moved. So in the radial pattern, you get a lot of expansion and contraction. So to understand how wood movement translates from a log into lumber, we actually have to understand how the lumber is cut out of the log. The most common thing you're going to find is flat sawn, and that's where they literally just slice this into flat pieces all the way across. And that's a very efficient way of making lumber and uses as much of the wood as possible. The problem with it is that some places the rings are running in different directions. On this board, you have places here where the rings are running through the board, and out here in the end, they're running across the board. So at this point, the wood is trying to expand and contract this way. And back here in the middle, the wood is trying to expand and contract this way. So this board is going to want to twist. And that's where you get boards that cup that go from flat to bent this way. Because they're trying to expand and contract in different directions along the board. Sometimes you have a piece of wood that will come out of the sawmill where the lines are running across the board like this. And this type of board is the one where you're going to see the most expansion and contraction. Because you're running across all those rings, and this is perfectly flat, this whole board is going to want to expand and contract this way quite a bit. It's not going to expand and contract this way much at all, but this way a lot. So with this board here, you can see that the rings are very tight right here. It's very close to the pith of the tree here. 
and then out here they're running across the board. So out here, this board is wanting to expand and contract this way. And because it's not that thick, it's not going to show very much expansion contraction here. Whereas back here, this board is wanting to expand and contract this way. And so this will cause this board to warp. And that's why flat sawn wood is so cheap because it's quicker and easier to make, there's less waste, but you're also gonna see more warping and twisting with the lumber over time. The next one you're gonna see is quarter sawn. And this is this quarter of the log here. And what they'll do is they'll cut the log in half and they'll cut it in quarters, and they'll cut a log off of here, they'll rotate 90 degrees, and they'll cut a board off of here, and they'll rotate 90 degrees, and they'll cut a board off of here, and they'll rotate 90 degrees, and they'll cut a board off of here, and back and forth until they run out of lumber. This ends up being fairly wasteful, is that there is a lot of other junk on the outside that disappears. On top of that, you end up with smaller boards, so they're harder to sell, and it is very time consuming to cut it because on every single cut you're rotating it, as opposed to on this one, you're just running the saw blade down lower and lower and slicing the board into pieces. But the nice thing about this is that you're going across the grain generally on most cuts. And because of that, you're starting to get into quarter sawn lumber. And this is where all the rings generally run across the board. This is a fairly stable piece of wood because it doesn't expand and contract this way much at all because this would be expanding from the inside of the tree to the outside and trees don't expand that way. This board is trying to expand this way, but because it's only a little bit thick, it's not going to expand and contract that way very much. You might see a, a thousandth of an inch in outdoor temperatures. So that's why quarter sawn is viewed as one of the more stable woods that people really want, but it costs more because it takes more work to make and there's more waste in it. Now, a while ago I showed how to make riven lumber and this is what quarter sawn wishes it would be. With this style, every board is a ray out from the center and you have extremely stable wood because you're cutting across the grain on all of these. And so every one of these boards will come out as a beautiful quarter sawn pattern and won't have any ring work in it. The problem with it is that you're gonna be wasting a lot of material and it takes a long time to make. But if you wanna spend the time or the money, riven lumber really is the way to go. And that's basically what firewood is. It's riven out from the tree, so it's incredibly stable. There is almost no movement this way in the board. All the movement is this way because the rings of the tree are cutting across the board. I have a video a while ago showing how to make riven lumber and you can actually take logs and with an ax or a fro, you can split lumber out of these and mill it down into usable lumber. And that gives you the most stable lumber you can get because not only are you getting the growth rings running across the board, but you're also running with the grain of the wood. So if the tree itself twists and you see these splits are actually running at an angle through the log, when you rive out the lumber, you'll be cutting it at an angle through the log so you'll be following that twist. And that means that you have grains running all the way from one end of the board to the other, giving an extremely strong surface. That's even stronger than quarter sawn wood because when the log twists and you cut through that twist, you're gonna be severing the fibers that don't go all the way from one end to the other. The other benefit to quarter sawn or riven lumber are rays. All hardwoods have rays and these medullary rays actually are veins that come from the center of the tree out to the outside. And a lot of times these cracks will propagate along those rays. But most trees, those rays are too hard to see. Some wood though, like oak, actually has a lot of rays and people want to see those. You can only see those rays though when you cut along the rays, which you do in quarter sawn and riven lumber because the rays are coming from the center out, if you cut along that line, you'll be exposing those rays and you can see them more. So this is a piece of quarter sawn and the pith of the tree is right here. And we're gonna be cutting along that line all the way out here. Now, because these rings grow out this way, on this side of the board, you're not gonna see any rays. You're just gonna see the cathedral arches of the rings. And that's because here you can see how we're cutting with the rings here. And then you might see some rays out here right on the edge because you're actually cutting across at this point. But on this side of the board, you're cutting across on most all of these growth rings. And because of that, you can see these rays coming out here, the medullary rays that really start to show up, especially in white oak. They're really beautiful. It's kind of hard to pick up on this video, but when you see them in person, they are rather stunning. So what does this all mean in the shop? Basically, if you see that the growth rings are running across the board, you know you have a fairly stable piece of wood, and this wood is not going to want to expand and contract much this way. However, if you come across a piece of wood where you're either cutting with the rings or you're seeing the rings swirl and moving out, you're gonna know that this board is probably gonna want a cup at some point. So if you imagine a cup on here where all the rings are forming a cup on the end of the board, it's going to want to flatten it out. So this is going to bow with the outsides going down and the top coming up. The cup will always want to flatten out. 
The other more common thing that people worry about is in the joinery. If I take these two boards and put them together, now they're all going to want to expand and contract this way. So I can know that this board will want to become wider over time. If all of these are quarter sawn, it's not going to want to grow quite as wide as if they are flat sawn. Though it will still expand and contract a little bit, most of its movement will want to be this way. But because it's so thin, there isn't going to be a noticeable amount of movement in this direction. All the movement you're going to see is across the board. For most things where you're only talking four, six, eight, ten inches, this movement really isn't that much. It's not a problem for indoor furniture. But when you're talking about a tabletop where you're talking four foot across, that movement might be a full quarter inch throughout the season. So that's where breadboard eggs come in. If my tabletop is three foot wide and it's expanding and contracting throughout the year by an eighth to a quarter inch, and I put a breadboard end on the end of it, this breadboard end is not going to expand and contract. Because remember, trees don't expand and contract lengthwise. So this board will not expand and contract lengthwise, but the table will expand and contract lengthwise. So that's why breadboard ends have a slot on the end, so that the table can actually expand and contract inside of the breadboard end. If you glue the table onto the breadboard end the whole way, you may come to a point where the table wants to expand and it starts breaking things apart. On dresser drawers and things where your joint comes together like this, it's not as much of a problem because all these boards are wanting to expand this way. So these will both want to expand up and down at the same rate. So with a dovetail, it's no issue at all. You can use all your glue you want because both boards will want to expand and contract at the same time. You just always want to be wary anytime you're in a cross grain situation. Anytime where one board intersects the other board, where the grains are going at 90 degrees to each other, you have to allow for some movement in here. So now let's get to the elephant in the room. If I have a breadboard end and I glue it completely onto my table end, is my table going to explode? Uh, maybe, maybe not. And by explode, I don't mean a sudden bang of a exploding. It's probably just going to be one day you start to notice a crack um, or a piece of wood pushes out or a tenon might slice. Um, but those are really extreme examples and usually only come after years and years of expansion contraction movement. Now, if your project is small and there isn't a whole lot of movement, then you're probably not going to worry about it. And I've done several projects where I have something completely captured, but it's small. The movement is really only going to be thousandths of an inch, and wood can be compressed in that space. So it's not a huge issue. But on a big tabletop, it might be an issue. If you're in an air-conditioned environment constantly where the temperature is always the same and the humidity is always the same, wood movement is really not going to be a problem, and you can glue boards together any way you want. But if for some reason someday the air conditioning fails, or you decide to go without it, or you go on vacation, and temperature changes and moisture changes, then it might be a problem. If your furniture is intended to go outside, it's going to be a problem because the moisture, the rain, it's going to soak it up a lot in the, in the wet season, and it's going to get rid of it all in the dry season, and there's going to be a lot of movement. And so if it's something outside, you've got to think about your joints. You've got to have them solid. And that's where screws come in because screws have a lot of flexibility in them. They can move around on a joint. And screws can be very good for outside as long as they're rated for weather use. But even with traditional joinery, if you do it right, and in your cross grain situations you allow for that movement, it can be a very strong joint that can last outside in the weather for years and years and years to come. So the next time you come to a joint and you're wondering, is this going to explode in the future? Look at the end grain on it and see which direction is it going to go. Is it going to be expanding mostly in this direction or is it going to be expanding mostly in this direction? Is it going to want to cup? Is it going to want to twist? Is it going to want to bend? These are things you can know by just looking at the end of the board and seeing which way is this going to be going in the future. Is this going to be a stable connection for the future? Or is this something I'm going to need to leave a little bit of movement space so that the boards can expand and contract? Because this is not steel. This is a living piece of wood that will expand and contract for the rest of its life. Wood never stays the same. And if you've ever run it through a planer and you measured its exact microns to the thickness you're looking for, you set it down, you come back out an hour later and you measure it again, it's probably going to be something slightly different. Because number one, you've removed some material and it's allowing more moisture to get in or out of inside. Or number two, it's just allowed to move and change over time. Wood changes and you have to allow for that. But all that being said, don't let this scare you off. Wood movement happens, but you can plan for it and it really isn't that much. People have this idea that if you have a four inch wide piece of wood, it's going to expand and contract a quarter inch. No, a four inch wide piece of wood might, might outside in the worst of conditions, expand and contract a 64th of an inch, if that. And if you're inside in an air conditioned environment 
wood movement is not going to cause that much of an issue. So don't worry about it that much. And if something does break in the future, oh well, it's wood. You can make a new one. <laughs> so I hope you like this. Uh, a lot of little information here, and I could go on for hours on this topic. There's a lot more that I could touch on. So if you have questions, let me know down in the comments below. I do try and read and respond to as many of them as possible. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Is there something else you'd like me to touch on in the future? Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. If you did like this video, please hit like, comment, subscribe. Uh, that really does help out the channel and help us grow. So I think that's about it for today. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Oh no! It's gonna explode! Ow.